install the service. And, uh, well, we've had all the news. So what will happen is um, we'll give you a bell. We'll phone you just to let you know what's happening next week. Just because uh, we haven't we haven't discussed it yet. We haven't seen all the the legalese about it. So that will that will that will keep you posted on what's going to happen next week. If, uh, So, let's sing our first, or not sing our first song, as, as they do in the trade. Um, so, there we go. when you don't sing. Let's, uh, let's pray together.
Father, as those words were sung without music, that sense of how magnificent you are, how different you are from us, you are God Almighty. And you love us and sent your son for us. We thank you. Help us to appreciate that more and more each day. To live in the good of it. To honour you as we live. Father, we ask that you'll meet with us here in this place, that you'll speak to us through Jeff, through your word, by your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I say, we give you a welcome to the service this morning. I'm sure most of you will know, uh, but we need to announce the sad news that Isabel Bennett died this week, and uh, we want to extend our sympathies. We started a new week today, correct. So last week, and... uh, we extend our, our sympathies and our prayers to you, Jeff, and the family at this time. We're going to sing another song. Now, I picked the songs because I wanted to actually have them. The topic that you may have seen on the screen was Our God is No Soft Touch. Just wanted to highlight that God is almighty, he's holy, and he's magnificent. And uh, so that's why I picked the, the, the songs. So let's pick this next one. Father in heaven, how we love you. So let's uh, stand and sing, or not sing. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all we are.
I've just picked out some verses from Matthew chapter 18. Just going to read a few of them. And uh, then Jeff is going to be speaking to us on Matthew 18 uh, later on. So it says in verse number one, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand causes or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. We'll stop there. Our God's no soft touch. There's some... Uh, probing questions in there. So before we welcome Jeff, we're going to stand again and sing King of Kings Majesty. And it's over to you, Jeff. King of Kings Majesty God of heaven living in me Gentle Saviour, closest friend Strong deliverer, beginning and end All within me falls at your throne Your majesty you love eternal faithful and true who bought the nations ransomed souls brought this sinner near to your throne
Hi, good morning everyone. It's uh, good to be here with you. Thank you for your uh, sympathy, love and prayers. Uh, uh, the funeral is arranged for the 16th of November at uh, 12.45. Unless the government starts altering everything, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Well, let's ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you we can gather. Thank you for your word. We pray that we might not only read it, but take it in and understand it and practice it. And it might be a, a blessing to us this morning. Build our faith and strengthen us in Christ's name. Amen. Along with chapter 16 and chapter 18, these are the two pivotal chapters in the book of Matthew. Because they're the only two places The only two places where something wrong, Jason. I don't think this is going to work, actually. Just turn it off. <coughs> Try again. No. There's a, there's about five slides before that. Do you want me to slide well, you can do. Yes. It's a new computer and it obviously doesn't like PowerPoint. There we are. And the reason why these two chapters are pivotal is because the word church occurs in them in the only place in all the Gospels. And that's very, very important. Now sadly, the Anglican divines, when the King James Version was being translated, outvoted the Puritan divines and they got their way in this word church. It's taken from the Greek Kyriakon, which actually is the Lord's house. So it's nothing at all to do with the, the church. As you probably all know, the word is ecclesia, which means the called out ones. That's right, those that were called out, uh, like in Acts, uh, the town council at Ephesus called out of the people of Ephesus to act as the town council. When William Tyndale translated the Bible or the New Testament from the Greek text, the very first man ever to do that, he used the word congregation. And that is really, that or assembly is perhaps the best. Now one text that I'd like to base this morning on is Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? A mother came to Napoleon seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor said, this was the man's second offence, and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, said the mother. I plead for mercy. But, said the emperor, he doesn't deserve mercy. And quick as a flash, sir, she said, it would not be mercy if it was deserved. Well then, said Napoleon, I'll save your son. So our first heading this morning then is to do justly and to be lowly. This is the last section of Matthew's narrative before he actually begins his journey to Jerusalem. You're probably all aware that every gospel, a quarter of the text, is given to the last week of the Lord's life. Jesus teaches what it means to live as a servant of the Messiah. He stresses the importance of lowly people in his kingdom. We have to understand the values of the kingdom. They're not the values of the world. Uprightness and a readiness to forgive. These are the important things. Now there was disagreement among the disciples on more than one occasion. And as we finish the account of Jesus' Galilean ministry, parts of it are in Mark and parts are in Luke. But here in a different context we have the words at that time the disciples came to Jesus 
and asked. I think there must have been more than 12 here present, uh, as we'll see in that. And the word, the key word, which actually translated in this version is came, it's the word come. And Matthew actually loves this word. 52 times out of 87 times in the whole New Testament are in Matthew. The word may be used of approaching a deity. People come to Jesus with their concerns. And the first real coming, of course, is for salvation. But here, an argument had been going on. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now note, these disciples, they didn't understand the kingdom of heaven. They saw it as earthly, temporary, uh, and not a spiritual and eternal kingdom. And the fact they asked the question, says Barclay, is they've no idea what the kingdom of heaven was. Well, Jesus doesn't actually answer them, but instead he brings in a child. And the child's brought in. I think this shows that there were others standing around a group of grown men and in the middle is this child weak helpless unimportant as you maybe know Jewish society gave children no rights whatsoever I think we perhaps of all nations in the world uh, in 1926 produced a children's act where the basics was the welfare of the child is paramount and our law and legislation has been based ever since on that 1926 Children's Act. So here's this child, no rights whatsoever, and Jesus now comes to them and he says, I tell you the truth. The actual Greek there is Amen, or truly as it's translated in other versions. Now, this only comes from the mouth of Jesus. In fact, in John's Gospel, 25 times, we have the double Amen, 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 which is really kind of emphasizing that he's telling the truth. So what they have got to do, they've got to turn. And that is it. I tell you the truth, unless you change, or turn is the actual word, and become like little children they don't have to be little children they have to be like so this indicates the change of direction it could be referring to conversion but the first condition of conversion means to turn to turn around and be converted repentance means to turn you're marching one way, the sergeant shouts about turn, and the whole squad go the other way. And that's a perfect illustration of the word repentance. And Jason's already put up 1 Thessalonians 1 I, how you turn to God from idols. Now adults have got to leave childlike behavior behind. There are some things, of course, we can learn from little children. There's trustfulness and dependence, but as adults, somehow like to, to assert themselves and rely on our, our own strength and our own wisdom. Uh, and, and this attitude, Jesus says, keeps you out of the kingdom of God. Notice that Jesus doesn't answer the question, but it is emphatic that double negative rules out the possibility of anybody entering the kingdom who was seeking great things for themselves. So who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? those who humble themselves. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So how is a person converted? Well, of course, by turning, becoming like a child, to become like a child is to trust. And when Christ called the child, the child demonstrated what Jesus actually meant. So firstly then, the child trusted Christ. He responded, or she responded, to the call of Christ. Sensed the openness, the warmth, the tenderness, the care, the love of Christ, 
felt free to respond and trust Christ's call. Secondly, the child surrendered themselves. I keep saying him or her, we'll have a him, shall we? Uh, and he was willing to give up what he was doing and, and go to Christ, willing to surrender whatever he was, was occupying his thoughts and his behavior. Thirdly, the child was obedient to Christ. He obeyed, did exactly what Christ requested, it was probably maybe difficult to do so, because at least there were 13 men standing around there and the child was being asked to walk in the midst of all these men. Note, he obeyed despite the difficulty and he's simply because Jesus asked him to. Fourthly then, the child was humble before Christ and all the above traits show humility. However, there's something often overlooked and abused by the adult world because little children don't push themselves forward. They're not interested in their prominence or their fame or their power or their wealth or their position. These things don't seem to come into the mind of a child. So therefore, that's a very good lesson to do justice and to be lowly. The next things we're taught in these verses is the great sin of putting a stumbling block in the way of young believers. Note the solemn word, woe. It's used by the Lord 82 times in the Gospels. And the rest of the New Testament, there will come up in a minute, the, these are the verses where it occurs. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Jude 11, and Revelation 8, 13, 9, 12, and 12, 12. So those are the only places that woe is used in the Bible. How many young converts, I wonder, are kept back from growing in Christ because of a cold shoulder in church? I read a true story of a girl who was converted at a Christian camp, and the leaders had emphasized that she was special to God, and after the holidays, she came from the same town, she decided to go to the church where the leaders went. As they came into the church, she was there. She kind of ran to greet them. They just walked straight past her and started chatting to friends. There's something fearful in those words, aren't there? It's not any wish, enough to wish to do good. We must be seeing to do good and not to be doing harm. J.C. Ryle says, one of Nathan's charges against David was, how be it, because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. So in verses 10 to 14, we're taught the, the value uh, of the lowest believer. And in verse 14, it's not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now comes the parable of the lost sheep. Of course, that's expanded in Luke, but here it appears in a, a different context. And these words really are an encouragement to all of us, as well as evangelizing the lost. The church has a responsibility to bring back people who've gone astray. Secondly then this morning, we are to be kind and to act right. And this brings us to verse 15 to 17, a very familiar situation where there's a breakdown in loving relationships between Christians. This can lead to all kinds of fragmentations and bitter disputings, and it must be dealt with carefully and biblically. And the whole purpose of Jesus giving this instruction is for reconciliation of the two parties concerned. So step one is for the two parties to get together privately. We're not to air our dirty linen in public. It's no good going around the church and saying, do you know what so-and-so said to me? That just makes matters far worse. We should go to so-and-so and say, can we talk about whatever it was? The second step where the first approach fails is to take two witnesses. Now notice these are witnesses. 
they're not going on on my side they're not to speak they're just a witness that I am trying to reconcile with another person and this approach reflects the Lord's relationship with us it's the only grounds for membership in the kingdom is that we are reconciled you know the unwillingness to forgive is I think one of the major causes of psychological breakdown just think about the, the speed at which mental health is coming to the fore everybody's blaming the virus but it's all there that bitter spirit which is actually a killer and if the person refuses then you have to take the third step which is tell it to the church and this means the body of believers they should come together regularly to pray and to plan the way forward the fellow is instructed that they have got to treat this, per treat this person as a Gentile and a tax collector well how do you teach tre te tre treat people from outside the fellowship you love them and seek to win them for Christ just an interesting note in verse 16 the you is plural so this is an instruction for the church and what is clear is we have these verses which give permission for the church to exercise discipline so the binding and the losing is declaring what's forbidden and what's permitted we know what behave, behavior is to be it's to be christ-like uh, and jesus is not giving the church permission to make decisions that bind god that would be alien the church there is responsive to the guidance of God and come to a decision that's already made in heaven I just wonder if the two of you uh, down in verse 20 where you come together is the offender and the offended and they've been reconciled you see these now are the priorities of the kingdom of God firstly loving one another secondly a mutual encouragement to turn from everything that would make us stumble and thirdly an unwillingness to compromise the truth or behavior friends we must remember that we are under the authority of the word of god so to ignore these words of the lord is really to say i know better than you and i'll do it kind of my way finally then this morning we have love mercy and forgive the kind of living is not easy so Peter from verse 21 on now wants to know about forgiveness maybe Peter had a situation in mind he was prone to speak his mind when his brain wasn't in gear now rabbis taught that you had to forgive three times as usual Jesus lifts forgiveness onto a new plane and he then uh, has it clear now this forgiveness now it's nothing to do with us saying to all the criminals oh we forgive you just carry on no 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 this is for Christians who cannot be reconciled now Romans 12 20 to the contrary if your enemy is hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him something to drink for by doing you will heap burning coals upon his head you may have heard of Archbishop Cranmer the Archbishop under Henry VIII during the Reformation it said of him if you did him an injury you because you could be sure he would be your friend he was a most loving and gracious man now the parable in verses 25 to 35 which end the chapter powerfully sums up the teaching so here's the first servant now the debt is colossal I didn't realize but the Greeks don't count above 10,000 in in the first century that was the highest number they had in their mathematics and the, the the talent mentioned is the highest unit of currency used in Bible times now the other debt is minute in comparison 
We all know, of course, Gareth Bale. Everybody knows this footballer guy. Did you know he's worth £165 million? And that's increased every week by his salary of £600,000. It's totally obscene. So this, we have this high 10,000 and this debt which is just trivial. The forgiven servant is motivated now by power and he goes to his debtor and he is trying to strangle him and make him pay up uh, this very small amount. But he made a fatal mistake. He had not understood the rules of the kingdom because what he's doing goes right against everything that Jesus had been teaching. So the kingdom of heaven is not about power, but it's about love. And of course, as you know, the story goes, the master then has this guy carted off to prison because he heard what he'd done to the other servant. So it's not about law, it's about grace. It's not about merit, it's about mercy. It's not about getting, but it's about giving. The great Martin Luther King, or the late Martin Luther King says, forgiveness is not an occasional act, it's a permanent attitude of a believer. And there we are, that's Matthew 18. It's a very full chapter, there's an awful lot of teaching in it, and if we just simply and humbly followed its directions, then we would be blessed indeed. And our fellowship would enrich and, and there'd be love and uh, reconciliations if there's any that are not. And God greatly would bless us in every way. Amen. Shall I close in prayer? Loving Father, we've looked through this chapter rather briefly, but we thank you that the Lord took the time to give the illustration of a little child, and he gave us all the other instructions about forgiveness and the illustration of the parable of the debts. Lord, we do pray that we might understand the rules, as they were, of the kingdom of heaven. We might be part of that, we might exhibit the rules and we might seek to love and to uh, be in fellowship with all believers. Lord, lift this virus. Please take it away that we can again meet freely and collectively as a, as a fellowship, part of your ecclesia here at West Grange. Be with us, Lord, through the coming week. Whatever happens, whether the government change the rules about Sunday worship, about funerals, may we trust you and follow you humbly and sincerely. So we ask that blessing that only comes from above, from the Father, from the Son, and from the Holy Spirit to be with each one of us now and through this coming week. Amen.